Well, congratulations to those of you that got into the call today because <laughs> most people have not been able to get in because the link is broken. So most people will have to just uh, watch the uh, replay. So we have a, uh, looks like we only have about 20 people on versus our normal 80 or 90. So um, hopefully you'll be able to talk back and forth and we'll be able to make this work right. So thanks for being on and, and uh, going through the hoops of getting on. I appreciate that. So here we go. If I can. Okay, well, I love the 90s. You know why I love the 90s? Because if you had a portfolio of 80% in the S&P 500, 20% in bonds, you would have had an average rate of return of 16.3% with an 11.3% standard deviation and a sharp ratio of an incredible 1.0. So how many of you, let me see that answer in this, how many of you would like to have uh, uh, been able to, uh, to have that kind of return on a regular basis? See the few of you that are on it. Yeah, sure. Sign me up, right, Tony? We'd all love that. So obviously, what we told everybody going into the 2000s was we should expect a what kind of return? Awesome return, right? With low volatility and a great sharp ratio. Well, what happened? What happened in the 2000s? Well, if you had that portfolio in the 2000s, you would have made virtually no money. Not a, not 16.3. You would have made virtually no money. So here's the thing: it's re recency bias. Recency bias. This is an example of uh, recency bias. Why did you? Why did I buy a four-wheel drive car? I mean, it's only we've had very right now in Minnesota. I can see the grass. I can see the grass out there, and it's the middle or late January, it's February already, and I can see the grass. So obviously, I don't need to buy a four-wheel drive. Was that typical for Minnesota? No, that's not typical at all. That's not typical at all. So, uh, but as as human beings, guess what? We fall for that recency bias all of the time, don't we? You fall for that recency bias all the time. And that's the difference between being an investor and a speculator. So an investor, Warren Buffett is an example of a, a, an investor. So what does Warren Buffett say about when he buys a stock? Does he buy stocks? Does Warren Buffett buy stocks? I've seen some answers to that. Does Warren Buffett buy stocks? I mean, we can all agree Warren Buffett is pr probably considered one of the best, if not the best, um, uh, investor out there today. He buys companies, right, Tony? He buys companies. And here's, he, he has this mentality. He says that when I buy a company, I buy it as, as if it's the, the, after the second I buy it, the stock market will cease to exist for the next 10 years. So why do you, what does he mean he buys it as if the stock market would cease to exist for the next 10 years? What does he mean by that? So he's buying the company as if the market is going to cease to exist Ah, he's not looking at the ups and downs, Tony, exactly right. He's buying that company knowing that who cares what it did last quarter? Who cares what it did last year even? He's buying it knowing that uh, he's going to be in this thing, that he bought it cheaply, that it's a good company, and over 10 years it's going to grow significantly. That's how he buys stock. That's an investor. A speculator does what? A speculator is in and out, in and out, in and out, trying to, to, to beat the market, trying to, to get out when the, before the market goes down, trying to get in before the market goes up. That is a speculator. So an investor buys a company not trying to get in and out at the best and worst times. Uh, that's, that's, uh, an investor buys a company knowing that it's a profitable, a good place to be. It's going to make money over time. A speculator is somebody trying to get in or out. So even if somebody's trying to get out, let me ask you this question. Even if we're, you, you try to get out before the market crashes, is that speculation? Because a lot of money managers say, no, no, what I'm trying to do is make your money safer. So what I'm going to do is try to get out before the market goes down. Is that speculation, trying to get out before the market goes down, guys? Yes. Trying to get in and out is speculation. So you have to understand, see, that's why, again, I love uh, equities. I'm fine with money managers. But we should be in <laughs> equities knowing that it's going to go up or down, but over time, it's going to go up and go up nicely. So if we don't believe that over 10 years the market's going to go up, then we better buy, be buying beans and ammunition. So we, we need to be in equities with half our money, but we need half our money if we're retired, and I'm not retired, but I still have half my money in guarantee. Does that make sense? But because of that, I just want to talk about today about um, the top, uh, the top, some of the top investors in the uh, world and some of the tidbits they have on investing. But before we do that, I want to just spend a little bit more time on recency bias. So in the last uh, uh, 10 years, the S&P averaged 
Energy averaged 17.71%. So what should we have been buying? And I will tell you straight out, the way too many guys I was talking about, was they were selling what? Oil and gas. I had a buddy who was bragging that he'd bought a bunch of apartment buildings up in North Dakota because of the oil boom that was going up there. What do you think happened to his apartments here in the last two months? Anything happened to his apartments in the last two months? He was bragging about what a great uh, uh, investor he was because he went and bought guys. <laughs> Just because, and in fact, when something's doing this well, this well, what does that do? What does that tell you? When energy is doing 17.71 and SP is doing 3.24, what's that tell you? What's that tell you? That the energy is going to keep going up like that? Yeah, time to get out of energy, Tony, exactly. So Ray Dalio, Bridgewater Associates, said the biggest, he's, uh, again, a very famous investor, the biggest mistake investors make is to believe that what has happened in the recent past is likely to persist. They assume that something that was a good investment in the recent past is still a good investment. Typically, high past returns simply imply that an asset has become more expensive and is poorer, not a better investment. So would that agree? Uh, I think a lot of people who invested in oil and gas would have loved to have read that prior to about two months ago, right? And, and guys, think about this. What has happened to SUV sales just in the last two months? What has happened to SUV sales in the last two months? Dino's got it. Yeah, they're up. They're soared, Dale says. Yeah, they're way up. Why? Because people now assume, hey, gas prices are low, so it's okay to what? Buy a gas guzzler. <laughs> so what do we know about gas prices, guys? Are, is gas prices guaranteed to be low, low for a long period of time? We don't, I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no, but I don't know. But people now assume, people that were a belly aching about how expensive gas was, it took them how long to forget that? How long did it forget? Did it take for them to forget that gas prices were high? Dudes, two months, 15 minutes, yeah, that's more like it, yeah. It's unbelievable. And do you think that people react any differently with, with uh, their money and stocks? They don't. They don't. Howard Marks, Oak Tree Capital Management. Here's his quote. Rule number one, most things will prove to be cyclical. Number two, some of the greatest opportunities for gain and loss come when other people forget rule number one. And we just talked about how quickly do people forget rule number one. Very, very quickly. Now, the question is, what if I'm smarter than the herd? Does that help you? When it comes to investing, what if you're smarter than the herd? Does that help you? If you're smarter than the herd, does that help you? Let's see how many of you guys get this. Richard says yes, Mick says no. And then I got some, so I got yes, no, and some. <laughs> well, I think an argue, argument could be made for any one of those. But the problem is this, is uh, when everybody's getting out, when a money manager, let's say that a money manager is smarter than the herd, right? Let's say a mutual fund manager is smarter than the herd. So individually, yes, if individually, if you're an individual investor and you manage your own money, being smarter than the herd can help you. But here's the problem. If, you man if you're either investing with a money manager, investing with a mutual fund, or you, uh, uh, being smarter than the herd does not help you. Let's see why. If you're, if you're investing your money with a, with a bunch of other people, or you're a money manager investing other people's money, why does being smarter than the herd not help you? You no control, do you know exactly right? So here's the thing. Let's say that I'm a smart guy, and um, I know that the market market is going down, down, down. That things are priced unbelievably well. Does that help me? If I'm a smart guy and I'm managing a whole bunch of money, and the market's gone down, and I think there's a great it's, that that it's a great time to invest. Does that help me? No, because what is everybody doing? What are all my investors doing? Putting money into my account or taking money out of my account? They're pulling out. So if they're pulling out, do I have any money to invest in the market? 
Do I have any money to put, 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 invest in the market? Now, let's say that the market is going up, 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 and I think this is a market is way, 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 way overvalued, and I pull my money out and sit on the sidelines, what happens to me as a money manager? Because here's the thing. With the market, even if it's way overvalued, could it continue to be overvalued for the next six months? Yes. Could it be continued to be overvalued for the next year? Yes. Could it even be continue to be overvalued for the next uh, 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 two years? Yes. But if I pull my money out when the market's overvalued, what will happen to my uh, portfolio? What will people do? They're going to bail on me. So the thing is, being smarter, if, if your money is in with a crowd of people, or, I mean, the only way being smarter than the herd is going to work for you is if you're only investing your own money. Then being smarter than the herd will help you. But if you, if you are investing other people's monies or you're investing with a bunch of other people, then being smarter than the herd helps you not because the herd mentality will crush you along with the herd. You are going to be that person crushed at the door as everybody's trying to leave. Because you, you can't stop. So the only way being smarter than the herd helps if you're only investing your own money, which means how much can we help our clients? How much can we help our clients from the herd mentality? We can't. You can help yourself because you're only investing your own money. But we can't help our clients because they're going to be hurt by the herd mentality. Everybody leaves, everybody leaves. Seth Klarman, Bopest. Most investors are primarily oriented toward return, how much they can make and pay very little attention to risk, how much they can lose. Well, how, when do they worry about how much they can lose? Because nobody believes they can lose until what? Nobody believes they can lose until they lose. I mean, this is, tell me this is wrong. I think this is the most hilarious graph. Cause it's hilarious because it's true. So number one, ah, the price is going up. Let's watch the market. Two, the trend is holding. I'll buy at the next consolidation. Three, doggone it, I missed the consolidation. But I, if I wait any longer, I won't profit from the trend. Let's buy. Good thing I bought, because look, it's gone up. Oh, wait, I'll use this correction to buy more. Brilliant, at this price, I can double my money. Wait, 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 ouch. This, as soon as it goes back up, I'm getting out of this thing. Oh, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. It's down to eight and a quarter. It's hit the absolute bottom. It can't go down lower than this. Oh, wow. Let's wait for this to recover. Otherwise, this is going to be the really long-term investment. What is the SEC doing? Number 10, what is the SEC doing about it? I mean, this is crazy. Number 11, enough. I'm out. I'm done. I'm, I can't afford to lose any more money. Goes down a little more. Aha, boy, am I glad that I sold. And then it recovers a little bit. Well, well, yeah, but it's going to tank again. But then it goes down. I told you so. I knew it was going to go down again. Wait a minute. It's going up. It, what? What the heck? 17, more crazy. Who, whoever's buying this is nuts. It's just going to go down again. And number 18, this is it. I knew this was going to happen all along. Drat, I'll buy it again. It's cheaper than the last time that I bought back here. Tell me that this is not, tell me this is not uh, what people do. Because if you look, if you go historically and look at inflows and outflows on managed money and mutual funds, when does all the money leave? On this, curve, on this uh, chart here, when does all the money leave? At the high? So that does everybody leave when the market's sc screaming up, when, we, when, they've, they, when they've made 30, 40, 50% rates of return? Is that when the money leaves, or does the money leave when they've just lost 50% of their money? When you look at historically, look at the numbers. When do they have is historic outflows uh, out of money management and out of uh, mutual funds? Exactly right, Dino, in, at the trough, right, right, Gene, in the trough, at the low. At the low, and then where, when do they have record inflows? In fact, we just saw this last summer: record inflows going in, what, getting out or getting in, getting in. Record inflows last summer, just in time to what? See all this volatility. It's crazy. That's how people invest. The speculators' deadly, deadly enemies, according to Edwin Lefebvre, the speculators' deadly enemies are ignorance, greed, fear, and hope. All the statute books, all the rules of all the exchanges on earth cannot eliminate these from the human animal. And what do we say? Even if you have some sort of system, some sort of knowledge to beat the crowd, does it help you if you're investing with other people? Do you guys get that? If you're investing with other people, it does not help. 
George Soros, it's not whether you're right or wrong that's important, but how much money you make when you're right and how much money you lose when you're wrong. So why do we like FIAs? Because how much money do you lose when you're wrong? Nothing. And that's why having half your money into an FIA, your client's money, is, is a great thing. Because when we have these, this kind of volatility, it's easy to talk to your clients. Jeremy Zweig, Wall Street Journal. Regression to the mean is the most powerful law of financial physics. Periods of above average performance are inevitably followed by below average returns. And bad times are inevitably set the stage for surprisingly good performance. Yet, does the crowd pay attention to this? Does the crowd pay attention to uh, regression to mean? Or when the market's going crazy, they want to put more money in. And when the market's doing poorly, they want to get out. See, people do not pay attention to a law, a financial law, a law that, that when you get too far away from the, the average, it's going to come back. In fact, it's going to go down below the average to get back to the average. And do people pay attention? No, they, they do the exact opposite. So here's an example of a reversion to mean. So here's the average, the, the red, uh, nice nice uh, red line here, but look at what happens. As soon as it goes way down, we know it's going to come back, get closer to that reversion to mean. or to, I'm sorry, to the, the, to the mean. And then when it goes way up, we know it's going to have to go down to get back to the version. And when it goes way down, we know it's going to have to go up. And when it goes way up, we know it's going to have to go down, because this is the average. Does that make sense? Ten-year average annual uh, nominal returns of large cap stocks, 1834 to 2013. Look at the average was 9% or about 8.7%, I think. Uh, and look at that's the yellow line going. That's the average. But how often is it at average? No, it's usually below or above, below or above, below or above. So when it gets way above, we know it's going to what? That's not the time to be buying more. So here, if you look here in uh, 1850, whatever it is. It was way above. Does that mean it can't go higher? No, it did go higher. But the higher it goes, the more likely it is to what? Go below. And so, oh, there it is, 8.6. That was the average. So the thing is, uh, we have to respect these laws. But in, instead of obeying our emotions, we have to respect these laws. There's another example of reversion. Uh, this is using pri uh, PE, price earnings ratio. So the pri average price earnings ratio is 18.3, but when it gets way above that, it's going to come down. Jeremy Grantham, GMO. You don't get rewarded for taking risk. You get rewarded for buying cheap assets. And if you, the asset you bought got pushed up in a price simply because they were risky, then you are not going to be rewarded for taking a risk. You're going to be punished for it. So you shouldn't be looking for, I mean, uh, uh, at stock prices, you should be looking at the underlying company and see, what is the cash flow of that company? What is the debt ratio of that company? How much debt does it have? Uh, it, we, that's the kind of thing you want to be looking at um, when you invest. If you don't want to put that kind of time and effort into it, now here's the problem with that. If you're buying cheap assets, that means nobody likes them, right? Can we agree that? If, if you're buying cheap assets, how many people like that particular company? If you're buying cheap assets, how many people like that particular company? Not many, right, not many. So if nobody likes that particular company, that means how well has that stock done recently? Poorly. So how, how easy is it to get people to buy stocks that have done poorly? That's a tough thing to do. But is that the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? That is the right thing to do. But the, so uh, it's, it's tough. Our job is very tough in dealing with clients. We, uh, going to them saying we should invest in this company because it's done stock has done very very poorly. Good luck selling that. Instead, we say, look at this stock; it's going it's going great. Let's get into that stock, which is the very wrong time to invest. Jer Jeffrey Gundlach, double line. The trick is to take risk and be paid for taking those risks, but to take a diversified basket of risk in a portfolio. The problem being, what happened to diversification in 2008? What happened to diversification in 2008? Didn't work, right, Tom? Did not work at all. So we're told, don't keep all of our eggs in one basket. But this is a story, you probably recognize it from the 21-point um, uh, checklist uh, 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 script. If, if I'm, uh, the reason we diversify is what? We don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket. 
Because if, if I have all my eggs in one basket and I drop that basket, what's going to happen to all those eggs? Well, they're going to get broken. But let me ask you a question. What if I had a, a pickup truck and I had a whole bunch of different baskets of eggs in the back? So I have a whole bunch of different baskets of eggs in the back, and then I hit a big pothole like 2008. What happened to those diversification? What happened to that diversification? When I hit that big pothole in 2008, to all those bags, eggs, they all went up and they all cracked. Wouldn't I have been better? Wouldn't I have been better to have all my eggs in one basket and have it on my lap? Wouldn't I have been better off to have all my eggs in one basket, have it on my lap, so when I saw the pothole coming, I could what? Lift that basket up, and then I lost what? Nothing. So that's why, again, I love, I love having half my money in an FIA because it's the perfect diversification. Why is an FIA the perfect diversification? I, you know, I take that back. I don't want to be perfect diversificated. Perfect diversification is this. Perfect diversification is this. If, if half of my portfolio goes up 10%, the other half goes down 10%, which means I get a return of what? Zero. That's perfect. I don't want perfect. I want the best. So the best diversification means that when one investment goes down, the other what? Can't lose money, right, Matt? That's the whole thing. You can't lose money. So perfect diversification is when one of your assets is not going to go down when the other one does. And that's what FIAs do for us. They give us perfect diversification because when the other asset's going down, we're not losing any money in that FIA. Because did, did FIAs go down in 2008, guys? No, they didn't. They didn't make any money, but they didn't lose any money. And they reinvested when the market was what? Down. But bonds went down. Real estate went down. Stocks went down. Commodities went down. Everything went down. So there was no way to... The FIA makes sure that at least half our money doesn't go down. That's the perfect diversification. That's having that, that basket of eggs on your lap. And you lift it up so that they're not affected by whatever happens that pot, with that pothole. So you don't want anybody to break anybody's nest egg. See, do you, do you want, and I talked about this I think last week or the week before, but I, I just want you to understand this. Would you want a client or should someone retire if they don't have enough money to retire? Should anybody retire? Would you ever give anybody the recommendation that they should retire if they do not have enough money to retire? No. That'd be nuts. Because should you say, hey, you don't have enough money to retire, but if we invest well, we can grow you out of this problem. What would you call that advisor who says, yeah, you don't have enough money to, to uh, retire, but I think that I can make you enough money with your investments so you can grow out of that problem? Yeah, a shark and a schmuck, I would agree with both of those. So now, let's say they do have enough money to retire. If they do have enough money to retire, then what is our job? If they've got enough money to retire, then what is our job as an advisor? What's our job as an advisor if they've got enough money to retire? To protect it, preservation? Yeah, protect it. I totally agree with that. But what else? It has to what? Because we're living long. Ah, some growth. Right, Dina? What do you mean by some grow? Keep ahead of inflation, Michelle. Exactly. My job as the advisor is to keep them ahead of inflation, to maintain their lifestyle. I, I should, should we be promising somebody that when they retire, we're going to make sure their lifestyle gets better and better every year? So 10 years from now, you're going to be able to buy a mansion. No. Well, we, our job is to say what? You will never have a lower lifestyle than you have right now. Isn't that our job? Or am I up to, can I see some yesters or no's on this? Isn't our job when somebody comes to us retirement to, to say, listen, you'll ne your lifestyle that you have right now, it'll never be less than it is right now. Isn't that our job? So if that's our job, our, what we simply need to do is keep them ahead of inflation, which is at what? Two or three percent, with the exception of health care. Health care is going crazy. But are there other ways for us to help them with the health care? First of all, most of these people will be on Medicare fairly soon that we're dealing with. And there's there other ways that we can help them with long-term care, et cetera. Yeah, we have the win-win-win, don't we? So really, our job with their assets is to keep them ahead of inflation, is to make 2 or 3%. Because if you make more than 2 or 3%, what, what would they do if you made them 15%, 20%, 30%? Guys, you've had years that you've done that for clients. How does that change their life? Please tell me. How does that change their life? I mean, are they, are they oh, wow, this is unbelievable. Where, 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 where? Yeah, Brad, it doesn't change at all. Do they go and buy the mansion? Do they, holy cold moly, we made 30% this year. We're going to sell our house and buy a mansion. Do they do that? 
holy moly, sell that Buick, we're buying a Maybach. Do they do that? Does it change their lifestyle at all? It doesn't. And But what do advisors, advisors get all twisted up with this. What are advisors constantly chasing? Now that's fine. You should be. Should you be chasing return for a 20 year old? Yes. Should you be chasing return for a 30 year old? Yes. Should you be chasing a, a, a return for a 40 year old? Yes. Even a 50 year old? Yes. But once they retire, should you be chasing gains? You should be maintain, making sure that they maintain the lifestyle that they have. And chasing gains means that some years you're going to beat the market and sometimes you're going to get clobbered by the market. See, the one thing that we don't want to ever want to do is break their nest egg just to, to get them more money that they're never going to do that, uh, uh, change their lifestyle. Making more money will not change their life. Yeah, they like it. Sure, they like making money. But it does not change their lifestyle. Our job as an advisor is to advise and let them know chasing return for something that will not change their life in even the tiniest amount at the risk of, of really changing their life next year by losing money, that's silly. See, when, if they break their nest egg, that does change their lifestyle. We've got the hardest job in the world. We've got the hardest job in the world. Please don't try to make it harder for yourself because we've already got the hardest job in the world. Don't try to make it harder for yourself. See, you can never make them happy enough with returns. Guys, if you give somebody a 12% rate of return next year, what do, they, what do they say to you? If you get somebody a 12% rate of return last year, what do they say to you? Thank you? What did they say? Yeah, why wasn't it 13? You know, why didn't we get more? I heard, you know, my, my buddy did 20. I mean, is it? See, you can never make them happy enough. And even if you do make them happy, because let me ask you a question, guys. Can rates of return make people happy? Can a high rate of return make somebody happy? It can't. Here's why. Let's, let's, let's say you made them a 30 percent rate of return, but their, but their wife left them. Are they going to be happy? Well, maybe. Maybe not. Uh, let's say they've got a 30 percent rate of return, and um, they have a huge health uh, problem. Is that going to make them happy? They have a huge rate of return, but their uh, child marries the, this scumbag that they hate. Is, that, is the rate of return going to make them happy? See, rates of return does not make somebody happy. Rates of return does not make somebody happy. It, it, at least not for what? Do you think they walk around every day? You know, when they come into your office, I agree. When they come into the office, see that they made 30% rate of return. Are they happy for a short period of time? I would totally agree with that. I'm not going to argue with that. Sure they are. But how long does that happiness last? How long does it last when you give somebody a 30% rate of return, guys? It's fleeting. It's fleeting. But here's the problem. Can you make them unhappy? Yeah, John, I love what John, uh, Big John said. Uh, he says, yeah, even when you give them a high rate of return, then what they're, they're not happy because they're worried they might lose that high rate of return. So, so even when you make them the high rate of return, they're worried about it. So you're exactly right. That's, that's hilarious. So the problem is we can't make them happy, but we sure can make them unhappy. Because when they lose a third of their assets, when they lose uh, a half of their assets, they are not happy. Now, let's talk about money managers who say, hey, I'm, I'm going to give you, so you, go, you sell the money manager like this. You say, hey, you know what? I'm going to not give you the highest rate of return when the market goes up, but I'm going to protect you against the downside. Do you get what I'm saying here? So the, so the manager says, let me write this down so you can see what I'm saying here. Because there's got to be, there's two types of managers. I'm going to move my little board over here. There's two types of managers. Oops, I don't want that one. I want this one. Can you all see my board here? There's two types of managers. One that says, I'm going to beat the market. What do we know about um, a manager says he's going to beat the market? What do we know about a market manager says he's going to beat the market? <laughs> Chris says he's a liar, that he's lucky. Yeah, so, so he's going to take, you get, the only way to beat the market is what? To, to take more risk in the market. And there are people that can beat the market some years, but they're going to have to take more risk in the market to do that. But I will tell you straight out, I'm... Uh, this is somebody that's easier to explain to a client than somebody who says, you know what, we're going to have a more conservative portfolio. 
Because what we're going to do is we may not get you the highest of highs. Instead of getting big market returns, we're only going to give you this return, okay? So we're not going to get all the return, but boy, when the market goes down, we're not going to lose that much. Guys, I, I, I cannot stand it, money managers like this. Why? Not because they're bad people. I can't stand money managers like this to explain it to my client. Why wouldn't I like a client, a, a manager who I could go to my client and say, listen, when the market does great, we're going to get most of that return, but when the market goes down, we're still going to go down. We just won't get, you know, we won't experience all of the down. Why is that? We just talked about it. Re, uh, uh, recency bias. Recency bias. Do they remember the, how you sold that money manager? Yeah, that's right, Michelle. The, the client doesn't hear that. See, it's recency bias. They don't remember what they were sold. What they remember is this. All their friends on their stock market got this, and they only got this. Their, their friends made 20, and they only made 12. So what do they say? What's the deal? What's the deal? Man, all my friends made a lot of money. Now, here's the thing. When the market falls 20%, and you lose, only lose 10%, what do they say? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for only losing 10% instead of 20%. Is that what clients say? No. So do you get why I love, when I, do you get why I prefer this? Because I can sell this. I can sell this to a client saying, listen, when the market goes up, and again, I'm not saying go after a guy who beats the market, but I'm saying this is easier to sell because if he's actually a good manager and over time does beat the market more often than not, but when the market goes down, he also goes down, that's easier to sell because if I sold it to the, to the client, then listen, I've got half my portfolio, i got half my portfolio right here, half the portfolio where it's never going to lose, never lose, and half the portfolio that over time, because we're investing is going to do great. That over time, over time, it's going to do great. Then I can say what? When the, if the market goes down, I say, yeah, remember, we said over time, this is going to do great. That's why we put 50% of the money here where we never lose money. So this is our part that's going to grow, and this is the part that's never going to lose money. See, that's an easy explanation. But man, trying to explain that we didn't get all the market when the market went up, but when the market went down, we didn't get nearly as much loss. That's just hard. That is really hard, unless you have a sophisticated investor. And how many of your investors are sophisticated? If they're sophisticated, how much money do they have? <laughs> a lot more than probably enough to work with us, right? So I love money managers. Just be, uh, remember what our job is. Our job is to keep them ahead of inflation. Don't make your job any harder than it has to be. Don't be chasing rates of return because if you're chasing rates of return, guess what? You're never going to get them to a point where they're happier, you know, they're, they're, you're changing their lives. But you will get them by chasing returns. You will have this on some years. And if that's a hard thing to do to tell them, hey, wait, everything's going to be okay after a few. If you got 50% of the money guaranteed, it's easy to say this. But if you're trying to, to explain why all their money went down 10%, when the market went down 20%, that's, that's, you're, you are going to lose clients that way. So does that make sense to you? I love money managers, but I, I don't, don't sell money managers as, as if something, um, they're not going to get all the return, but they're also not going to lose all the uh, uh, share. They're not going to uh, make big losses either. That's just hard. To, to explain to people. They have recency bias. They forget how that was sold. And they're saying, listen, when the market's up, I want the market to be, it's easier to just say, it's simple, simple and easy, black and white. When the market's up, this is doing well, and this, is do, and the, the, this over here is doing okay. When the market's going down, this is going to go down, but at least we, we have this money safe so that we won't lose that money. It's, it's a much easier thing to sell them on every single time that you're in so when things do happen, they're cool, calm, and collected because it's, it's doing exactly what they remembered. Half of it's going to go up when the market goes up and down when the market goes down, and half of it's going to do okay when the market's up and not lose any money when the market's down. Does that make sense or am I, am I speaking Greek to all you guys? Doesn't it seem like that's what all of these 
in, in one shape, form, or another, isn't that what all of these uh, very famous, very uh, uh, successful investment professionals are saying? It's just they're saying the exact the same thing in different ways, aren't they? Does that make sense? Cool. So I appreciate you uh, letting me get on my soapbox here, but I'm just trying to help you guys uh, break any habits you might have of chasing returns. And you know, explain this. If you explain this to a client, what do you think this whole thing about? Hey, what's my job for you? Because if you don't have enough money to retire, should you retire? What would a client say? They say, No, you shouldn't retire then. Well, if you have enough money, what's my job to make sure? I mean, is it to to try to to make you enough money so you can buy a mansion? Is it to buy, is it try to make enough money so you can buy a Rolls Royce? How many of your clients are going to say, yeah, that's your job? What are your clients going to say? No, I want to make sure that I maintain my lifestyle. So then I understand that what my job is to do is to keep you ahead of inflation. So that means we should be shooting for what kind of returns? And anything we do above that is going to be terrific as long as we don't what? Move backwards. Because making more money, what does it do? Guys, if you educated your clients like this, how much problem would you have? And actually... If you educate your clients like that, won't that even help with this problem that we were just talking about with, with um, having a money manager that when you only lose 10% and the market went down 20%, could you just say, well, overall, haven't we been keeping you above that overall 2 or 3%? Make sure you're, you're speaking and consistent in your message to your client and make sure they're selling you on what your job is. Don't sell them on what your job is. Do not sell them on what your job is. Have them sell you on what your job is. Because when they sell you on what their job is, then that's going to last a lot longer. Does it make sense to everybody? Super. Well, I appreciate you. Uh, sorry for the hassles of getting on today, and I appreciate all you guys. And hopefully you don't mind me getting in my soapbox about this stuff every once in a while just to remind you. And I hope you all have a terrific – any questions, concerns before I let you guys go? I'm getting done kind of early here today. I see nothing. So super. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you all on Friday. Have a great week. Thanks.